Oh, it's an auspicious day for Brandon Heckman to be writing Brian Heckman. Hi, cuz. How are ya? Oh, good things are happening for Mr. Heckman on so many levels. Um, and now's a real good time to get in on that story because it's a really exciting, really fun story with all kinds of awesome moving parts. So, um, you and I are, um, I, we're just dancing around a phone call, apparently. Um, but I want to make a suggestion for you. Suggestion numero uno, right? Attached to this video is going to be a Google Drive link, okay? It's going to have two PowerPoints. I just sent these to Mayo Clinic. Dr. Paul Anderson of Herman House, which is a private pay mood disorder unit associated with Mayo Clinic. I was patient three at Herman House four years ago. And then Herman House got shut down after COVID. The first iteration of Herman House was an unmitigated disaster. I think everybody can agree to that. Um, I think I suffered worse than anyone, which, um, you know, <laughs> we'll get to that later. Um, but basically, I've been, um, you know, while I was incarcerated in that shit facility against my will, you know, Ed and Chris were kind enough to tell me that if I didn't do exactly what they wanted, they were going to take everything, including my phone, away from me, drive me out into the middle of nowhere, just a field in the middle of nowhere, and dump me with no coat in the dead of winter. And I was going to be on my own. That was, that was, you know, it was Herman House or it was homelessness in the middle of nowhere where I didn't know anybody, no money, no phone. I think I would have been lucky to have shoes. But, you know, that's basically what was going on. And because my dad's an awesome bully, he made Mayo an accessory to a kidnapping. So I'm fixing their program for them. I met the new director of Herman House in December as one does through one's life's travels, bumping into people and so on. It's not really coincidence. I've actually since gotten excellent treatment from Mayo Psychiatry, just not from Herman House. Um, and um, I'm in really good with the entire department of Mayo Psychiatry. They think I'm pretty cool. And they love my ideas, they love my theories and my philosophy, and they like my treatment modality. And they've been asking me to write a, a graphic novel for the last couple of years. So I just started that a couple weeks ago. Actually, I'll show you a couple pages of that because those are really pretty spiffy. Um, boom, 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 boom. All right, so hold on. Boom, 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 boom. So this is obviously still a work in progress. That's page one, and then this is page, a two-page spread for page two and page three. Yeah, so Mayo is really interested in exploring my model of mind. I have a really unusual model of mind. Mayo's Department of Psychiatry and Psychology thinks it's really cutting edge and it's where we need to be going. Um, and what's really cool is that um, the, the new Dr. Anderson and I had a really nice phone call in December and I walked him through everything that the facility did wrong and then I told him what they needed to do to fix the facility to get it up to snuff with someplace like Skyland Trail or Rogers or you know a comparable facility um, teaching DBT and doing that level of mood disorder treatment um, and then I said you know look I, I I can take you a lot farther like you know if you if you want if you want a waiting list that feels um, that is so long it feels unethical I can give you that and I said okay what are you going to do? So I pitched him an extraordinary and revolutionary program. So that's what those two PowerPoints are. That's a really good introduction to, um, you, you, you really don't, you know, the last time you saw me, you visited John and me in Chicago, and I didn't tell you what I was doing at the time. <laughs> you had no idea. Nobody had any idea. I was very deeply involved in the 2008 market crash. In the movie The Big Short, um, 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 I always want to call him Ryan Philippine, but it's Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling's character is selling research to to uh, to, to um, hedge fund managers and, and, and stockbrokers and stuff. And Steve Carell's team, the, the fellow's name is Mark Baum, um, decided to buy this research. That was my work. <laughs> um, um, so it was also my work was in that it was in that bunch. I, I, I produced a body of work with um, Wells Fargo CEO John Stumpf from um, 2005 
to 2007. In 2005, I persuaded the uh, board of Wells Fargo and, I, and, and its CEO, John Stumpf, that the market was going to crash in August of 2008, that it was going to wipe out Lehman and Morgan and Bayer and Goldman, um, and that um, that also was not going to be the end of it, but actually we would experience shocks of equal or greater magnitude for the next 16 quarters. Or no, 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 32 quarters. Um, more than that. Um, it was eight years, um, the next eight years. Um, and that's why we had quantitative easing was to hide all of that. Um, and so I said, what needs to happen is we have to warn the American public. So Stomp and the board asked me to do a special project um, that I titled Equities of Mass Destruction. <laughs> um, and he re later made me retitle Equities of Mass Disruption, little bitch. Um, and Dr. Uh, Mr. Stumpf um, gave me just every white paper imaginable and from that i basically was able to put together the best picture on the market of, of all of the assets um, all of the mortgage-backed securities all the credit default swaps i basically did one big audit on the entire industry and from that i was able to document and, and, and predict where all the shocks would hit and then i was also in in talks with the fed at the time and I, I built a model of what not to do, which would later become quantitative easing. Um, so in what was supposed to happen, what Stumpf and I agreed would happen, was that my mentor, who would go on to become the CEO of Wells Fargo, John Shrewsbury, um, would, uh, would go on Jim Cramer with me in um, January of 2007, before I calculated the bull market would hit. Um, because once the bull market hit, I knew that the, I knew, I knew, I mean, there was no, there was absolutely no way that the board could f remotely support this work and support going live with this work and support um, asking Congress to take action before the worst happened because shareholders would revolt and everybody would lose their jobs and I would lose my job. Um, and I knew that the board wouldn't take that action. So we had a very narrow window of opportunity to get the message out into the world. And um, I, I mean, you know, if you're everybody else in the world looking at Wells Fargo, you're saying Wells Fargo were bad people. They, they, they deceived you that, you know, they were never actually going to do that. I don't know what to think. I just know that it didn't happen. I know that um, in... Um, Oh, uh, when was that? So once the bull market ramped up in the spring of 2007, um, no, 2008, no, no, summer 2007. I'm sorry, I'm not remembering right. Okay, once we were a couple months into the bull market, um, it was very, very clear that this wasn't going to happen anymore. Um, and um, the board instructed Stomp to um, suspend his relationship with me. Um discredit me throughout the bank um, and completely shelved my res research. Um, I was suspended. Um, all of my, everything in my office was confiscated. Um, and then when I was brought back to work, um, Wells Fargo basically never, I worked another eight years. I never actually had an assignment at Wells Fargo again. I got paid to warm a chair. I literally went back to school. <laughs> I went for hikes. I went on adventures. I never, I would like, I drew at my desk. There was nothing to do. Wells Fargo wouldn't give me any work. I was banned from getting any new work. But back to getting shelved. A couple months after that happened, a fellow by the name of Mark Baum, who would go on to be, play, be played by Steve Carell, gave me a jingle and said, hey, we're this, um, this um, up and coming hedge fund and we're affiliated with Morgan Stanley. And first of all, we've got your, we've got your research and we're terrified about what's gonna happen to Morgan Stanley. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, your research is an excellent vas vassal with which to short the market. And we feel like the best thing that we can do to protect Morgan St Stanley shareholders is to short the market. And we would like to pay you $350,000 a year. And we'd like to give you a million dollar hiring bonus that you can invest with us so that you can do this too. And we'd like you to move to Manhattan immediately 
and we'd like you to le show us how to use your research to short the market. This is not who I am. <laughs> I am not a, I, I'm not in this game to make money. I'm in this game to save lives. I'm in this game to make things better for people. I'm a humanitarian. Um, I have felt since I was two years old that God put me on this planet to save the world. Um, and I've always maintained and believed that my mission is not to get rich like my father, but to leave the world a better place for your children if I don't end up having any of my own. So I said to him, to his team, I said, well, if you'll agree with me that every single penny that we make doing this goes into an escrow account that we publicly announce will be used to keep American mortgage holders in their homes, which will be a huge coup, <laughs> public, public relations coup for Morgan Stanley. It's going to look great for your investors. It's not going to look great for, for their bottom line, but, this, the, but, but, but what it, all the other banks are going to look like fucking raging criminals. And if you do this, you'll redeem your, your, bank's, your bank's reputation. If you do that, which is, which is the right and moral thing to do and humane thing to do, then I will absolutely drop everything and I will help you short, short the market. And I said, you're crazy. I said, you're dicks for shorting the market. And I hung up the phone. Um, fast forward to the big short, that whole story gets changed around a little bit, but at the peak of the movie when everybody's, when the market's crashing and everybody's getting ready to short, Mark Baum, a.k.a. Steve Carell, charges into his office. You, what do you have? You, what do you have, last guy? What do you have? Yeah, you know that guy with the hot research from the Midwest? Yeah, what does he say? He says we're dicks for shorting the market. So there's your cousin's claim to fame. My work would later go on to become the foundation of quantitative easing. It's the, you know, Marvin Martian red button, don't do this under any circumstance foundation of quantitative easing. But that's the truth. I'm not the first person to come up with quantitative easing. Japan's new... Um, 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 equivalent to our Federal Reserve Chairman. He actually um, studied with Ben Bernanke at MIT around that time, or a couple of years around that time, or no, in the 90s, in the 90s, the study in the 90s. And, and I mean, they, 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 were, they were thinking about stimulus spending of this nature then. Um, I think that sweeping toxic assets under a nation's currency is an absolutely terrible idea. You're bound to get bad inflation 20 years later. And that's what I told them. Whoops. <laughs> anyway, so that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. When you visited John and me and, and uh, um, we were talking about how to grow magic mushrooms and getting really, really stoned, what I left off the table entirely to you is that my life, was a, my life at work was a movie. And um, I came really close to saving the American people. I think depending on, I mean, like, I think a lot of people would say that quantitative easing saved America. I think a lot of people would say that it saved the world. I don't think that it did. I don't think that we're better off because of it. But, I mean, you know, like, anyway, there are witnesses to this, too. Um, I, uh, yeah, anyway. But, yeah. So check out the presentation, first of all. I know that Sue showed you Stretching On Into Apocalypse. There are several other books on Amazon, but that's really the one to read. It's, um, I don't even want to spoil it. It's just, it's, it's, um, oh, bioweapons on refrigerated trucks circulating in liberal urban population centers <laughs> and a showdown on the Senate floor. It's so good. <laughs> it's so, so, so good. Um, yeah, I've been, and then, um, basically, like, after I left, um, John, and I left Wells Fargo, I, uh, I had, um, about half a million in cash, um, and, um, I'd been doing a lot of really successful work with, um, meditation, and I had actually, um, I had hit Nirvana about the year before, and as a drug person, I recognized immediately that the bliss, that the, that, that actually the the Buddhist mistake and the, the bliss isn't the point. Um, it's actually the fabric of, of awareness that's behind the, the bliss. 
Um, and that is actually a super framework that allows you to do some really extraordinary things and go much, 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 much farther than the Buddha ever reported going. Um, and um, um, my pathways ultimately were a lot easier than his, um, you know, and, and they just delivered the goods. And you'll see that in the presentation because I talk a lot about what I learned in meditation and how to really make it um, a lot easier to grasp a lot easier to practice, a lot easier to keep going. Um, so, um, yeah, I, um, it felt really, after a summer in Stoughton, knowing that Ed and Chris were continuously scheming to take everything away from me, and hearing from their friends continuously that I was in danger, and things in Chicago just didn't work out, um, and Trump was surging to electoral victory a few months later. I just was like, man, I want an adventure. I've never had it a true adventure. And I really feel like, like, you know, now's the time. Let's, you know, let's like, okay, so I took one big stab at making my life's calling happen with economics and that didn't go anywhere good. But I mean, what if, what if I really do this a different way, you know? What if I really do this a different way? What if I do something completely different? I thought, what if I tackle climate change? And what I thought that summer in my heightened state of consciousness was just, man, I think we're fucking the planet up because we've got a completely wrong idea about ourselves. That's what I think. If, if we're this wrong about meditation and if we're this wrong about higher states of consciousness, and what I'm, you know, I mean, then, then we're probably wrong about the universe too. Like all of our, all of our models are good enough to produce commodities and waste and destroy our planet by accident. You follow? All that good stuff. Absolute wonderland. EdenicReturn.com Yep. Have a peek at something. <laughs> um, it'll blow your mind. Um, yeah, it's fun stuff. Have a peek. And um, give me a call sometime.